So something that we can probably do on air mat is then dig in to your top pandas tips. So we actually had the creator of pandas, Wes McKinney, on a recent Super Data Science episode on number 523. And we talked about the genesis of pandas. And then we talked a lot about libraries that he's been working on since and companies that he's built. We didn't actually talk about pandas and how to use it and what his top tips might be. I'd love to hear yours. And I think you have some great ones for us. Sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll start off with what might be the most controversial tip that I see. So so as I said, I think my my thoughts around pandas and, and the proper care and feeding of pandas have, have, have grown stronger as as I've used it and, and seen it. But my first one and it is to leverage what is called chaining. Now, mm-hmm. um, if, if you go to like my Twitter, I don't generally post a lot of cat photos, but or if you go to LinkedIn, I, I, I often will post code as images and you will see a lot of my pandas code. And this tends to elicit a strong response, either positively or negatively, the code <laughs> that I post. Uh, I've had people say, this is the worst code that I've ever seen. I've had people say that I would never work with you. And then I get also on the flip side, I get people like, this is awesome. This changed how I write code. Um, my life is much better after doing that. So let me maybe just explain basically chaining and how I see that, uh, at we have in pandas, we have basically two data structures. We have a series, which you can think of if you're thinking in the database, that's like a column from a database. And uh, then we have the, the data frame, which if you're thinking of databases, it's like a table. So those are the two main uh, s- structures that we have. And most operations on either a data frame or a series, and there's about 400 different methods, if you look at those on both of them, most of those will return back one of those objects, a series or a data frame, or sometimes if they're reducing, they might return a scalar object back. So if, if you think about like a, from a data science perspective, especially like data janitor work, cleaning up your data, prepping it for machine learning or whatnot, most of the data in the wild is not great as is. It needs a lot of sort of nudging, cleaning up, maybe uh, reformatting it or restructuring it how it is. And um, I like to write those uh, restructuring uh, instructions as a series of basically uh, steps, step by step. And and a lot of, so what I'll do is I'll actually put a parenthesis at the top of my code and I'll put a parenthesis at the end. And, and parentheses mean a couple things in Python, but in this case, uh, this is a parenthesis for basically a parenthetical, like if you're doing a math operation, you would add two numbers before multiplying them. And, and what it allows you to do in Python is it allows you to basically escape white space rules. So I can say, I'm going to start off with my raw data, and then I'm going to go to the next line, and then I'm going to just put the single operation that I'm going to do on the next line. I actually have on, on, on my screen here, I've got uh, some pandas code that I've written uh, for a sales report uh, that I generated. And so maybe I can just describe a, it for... A sales report of your own yeah. uh, sales? Yeah, of, of my own sales from from uh, the Metasnake website. Um, and and so uh, I guess I can put that on the screen here for YouTubers, but um, amazing. Um, you can see that at the top there, I've got cells, right? So I'm just going to take my sales data frame, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to query it. So I've got a single call to the query method, and I'm just filtering uh, cells that were actually paid, and I'm filtering the bundle. And so that is going to return a data frame. So I'm going to just keep operating on that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a group by. This is one of those super powerful features of Pandas. It lets you basically pivot the data. And I'm going to group mm-hmm. this by the date at a month uh, frequency. And I'm also going to pivot it by a category. So this is going to give me what's called a hierarchical uh, index or multi-index when I return this. Um, and then on that grouping, I want to apply these two aggregations. So that's the next line is the aggregations. I'm going to uh, total the sales, and then I'm going to uh, count the number of items in there. That's going to return me another data frame. Now, this is going to, because of how I grouped it, I grouped it with date and category. It's going to have a hierarchical uh, index. And so I, I want to do the next line here is I'm going to unstack that, which is going to rotate 
uh, one of the indexes into a column. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off one of those columns. Uh, because this is now hierarchical columns, I'm going to pull off on the columns, which is total cells. And then I'm going to pull off the course column from that. And this should give me basically the sum of all the course cells and the count of all the course cells. And then I'm going to add uh, some exponentially weighted uh, moving averages to uh, sort of do a, a very simple prediction on that, which is uh, the next line after that. So this is all written. Uh, there's about eight steps in this, which is basically I want to do a simple prediction on what my core cells will be like, but, but I've written it in this chain. And generally when I'm writing this, I can sort of step through it one line at a time. I'm, I'm starting at the raw data and then I'm just building this chain, which if you, if, if you get used to this, starts looking like a recipe. And then uh, your code uh, is very easy to come back to. What I find generally is that 90 plus percent of people when they're writing pandas, they'll write each of these steps, each of these eight steps is like, either an individual line and store the intermediate data frame mm -hmm. or they'll put mm -hmm. them in different cells and they might even not mm -hmm. put the cells in the right order. Mm -hmm. And so what I find is that that makes it really hard to understand. Yeah. And it also makes it really hard to come back to hard to understand because our brains have limited capacity. If you look at the working mm -hmm. memory, right? What you can store in your brain, mm -hmm. you know, commonly people say seven plus or minus two. And if I've got all these intermediate variables that I'm just keeping around, that's, to me, that's just digital noise. It's getting in the way. I don't really care about those. I care about the end result. So I'm just mm -hmm. sort of, it, it's like saying, I'm going to put some restrictions on how you code. And it might feel like those restrictions are harder. But after you sort of embrace the restrictions, it's going to force you to write better code. What I can do after I've written this chain is I can then take that whole chain. And oftentimes, I'll, I'll make a chain to like clean up just do janitorial work and I'll take that chain, put it into a function and put it at the very top of my, my uh, notebook. And then when I come back to my notebook, all I have to do is load my raw data and then run this function that cleans it up and I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about running these cells in arbitrary order or keeping track of these intermediate things. So that, that's probably a, a practice and I find it similar to, to like, I also teach on Python and when I teach people about Python, one of the things that's weird in Python is white space. It's, it's kind of novel for the language. And a lot of people, especially those who have years of like C or job experience, come to Python and, and maybe their, their, their company is saying, you know, we're using Python because like you said, it's the most popular language for certain uh, applications. So we're going we're gonna to learn Python, even though you're a job or C expert. And a lot of these people are like, oh, it's got white space. And, and, and that white space really bothers me that you have to indent even though these people indent their code normally, but they're like, that bothers me. And and what I find is most of the people after a day of like just learning the rules are like, this doesn't even matter. It's not even a big deal. And so similar thing here with the chaining. Um, it is different because most people aren't doing it and most people don't see it. But if you adopt this, um, my take is that it's generally going to make it so you are focused on making a recipe of code, of steps that you're going to do. And it's going to force you to uh, uh, be more clear and uh, you're going to be able to read your code and come back to it. But also, if you start sharing it or collaborating with others, it's really easy to do that. And if you, if you write it in a single chain, you can start testing it as well. You put it into a function and now you can test it. You really don't care about the intermediate state. You, you only care about the end result of that. So you, th this basically wraps up the recipe from raw data to end result. So well, that, that's uh, my first uh, tip. Uh, yeah, and so I have good news for you, Matt, which is that I am firmly in the chaining camp. Uh, so I absolutely love chaining. For There's no point in me repeating <laughs> everything that you just said. You articulately made the case for chaining and then even summarized it, so I'm not going to bore the audience by just repeating it again. But I am a big chainer. I love not having intermediate variables. They just, as you say, they're just clutter. They make it harder to understand my own code, to understand other people's code. I love chaining and I've been into the idea ever since the dplyr library in R. So I was big into R before I got into Python and the dplyr library allowed the same thing. And the, my first experiences with that, with piping uh, in R was like, this is incredible. My code is so much cleaner and easier to understand. 
you just have this process, just this pipe of processing. You showed us the example in code, actually in your screen share there. And yeah, you can have any, you, you're just, your data just flow through this pipeline and you can see exactly what that pipeline is from start to finish. It's so neat and clean. Um, and yeah, so I do the same with my pandas code as well. Awesome. Thank you for that first tip. You're You're in the 1% club. <laughs> well, we are a, I think, a very elite one percent. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to make that not one percent, but th this is something that I see that a lot of a lot of like blog posts or people like how to use pandas. They, they just don't even talk about this. So I, I feel like this is, for some reason, a lot of people from R. You know, they're used to the pipe and, and people from Python world. That it, it's. Just not novel, which is interesting because even in in Unix at the command line, yeah, piping is super common. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, yeah. So that was your first tip. That's my and first tip. What's yeah, up my, next? My next one would probably be working with raw data, and and this isn't necessarily panda specific, but it, maybe you can combine it with you know if if you are making this chain and you do what I said, you you load your data and then you have this chain. I like to take that and and put it into a function, and then I put the, the cell that loads my data at the very top, and the next one that just cleans it uh, below that as a function. Invariably, what I found in consulting arrangements, or even uh, you know in work or, or um, teaching, someone will say, "Why is that? Well, why did you get that number?" Right. And so, if you are not working with raw data, it, making those explanations, tracing your code is kind of hard. But if you're using chaining and you work with the raw data, you can actually trace the code and you can trace the data through every step of that. And you can say, oh, this is why the average is this. Or, and, and it makes um, basically explaining to the higher ups very easy if you work with the raw data. So that would be probably my second tip. Nice. That one was quite concise <laughs> after chaining was so in depth, but yeah, working with raw data, it's almost self-explanatory. If you don't work with the raw data, how are you going to be able to explain in any detail uh, if there's any further probing on, on some summary stats that you have? So I love that. You can also, uh, working with raw data, you can also identify issues. You know, there's, there could be issues with the incoming data pipelines that in summary stats, those are uh, obscured and uh, yeah, and, and misleading. All right, nice. so that's chaining that we've already got. We've got working with raw data. What's your third tip for us, Matt? Yeah, my next one is related to both of those, but I'm going to mention it separately, and that would be organizing your Jupyter code, which, again, might not be Panda-specific, but if, if you follow that chain and then you uh, put your code in a way where you can execute your cells one by one, what that does is it starts to enable collaboration and enable you to work with your code easily. One, one of the common complaints that you hear in the Python realm is that Jupyter, although it's nice because you can execute things out of order or whatnot, it makes things hard. And yeah, I get that. I mean, sometimes when I'm doing loose goose exploratory data analysis, I might just make random cells all over the place. But if I were to run that from start to end, it wouldn't work. Um, mm -hmm. So leveraging sort of the, the best practice of chaining and then you know, I like to tell my students, anytime you're going to start to collaborate with someone, you do want to make sure that you can take your notebook and run it from the start to the end without issues. There's nothing 100%. more frustrating than coming to a notebook that if you look at like in notebooks, actually there's numbers on the side that tell you the order in which uh, cells mm -hmm. were executed. And you go yeah. through these and it's like higher numbers can, come before lower numbers, yeah, indicating that yeah, the cell yeah, above yeah. was run after the cells below it. Yeah, you should be able to clear all outputs and restart the notebook and just run all cells and all the numbers should be in order. You should not have any errors thrown. Exactly. It's, it's maddening if you get a notebook sent to you that only works if you execute the cells out of order. Yeah. So, so again, that's probably one of those things where you just have to put some constraints on and make sure that uh, you're doing things in, inside a certain framework and that will help you. Uh, next one would probably be an, another one that you see a, a lot of people throwing around advice on the internet, which is, they say there's this apply method, which if, if you think about it, is it, sort of like pipe, but it, um, it, it has a drawback. So it, for those who aren't aware, uh, again, we, we have series and we have a data frame. 
And a, a series basically is a vector of data. And how pandas works is basically leveraging NumPy. And what NumPy gives us is it instead of having a, a series of individual Python objects like Python integers or Python floats, it's going to give us a buffer of, of uh, data in memory. And uh, we don't have the overhead of Python uh, for a series. And so if you want to add something to a series, you can say like plus two, and it will leverage modern computer architecture, SIMD instructions, and um, uh, basically say, here's the buffer, add two to that, it will give you a new buffer versus uh, using apply. What apply will say, pull out each individual number, convert it to a Python object, then run uh, some code on it. So people say, you'll, you'll hear this thrown around, oh, you can use apply and you just write Python code and it works. It does work. However, you, at this point, you're going down what I say is the slow path because you're taking mm -hmm. something that's very optimized and then you're pulling it back into Python, which is a slow language. So mm -hmm. if you can avoid apply, generally your code will run faster. Now, there are cases uh, where I think apply is okay. So maybe I'll just put a caveat on that. If you're doing numeric operations and you're using apply to me, that's a code smell, a hint that you probably could be doing this in a different way and it would probably run 10 to 50 to 100 times faster. Right. However, if you are using strings in pandas, how pandas represent strings is it doesn't have an optimized storage mechanism for strings. It's basically has a buffer, but those buffers are pointing back to Python objects for the strings. So I'm okay with apply if you're doing apply on a series that has string data in it, because at that point you're already in the slow path. So that, that would be my next one is just look for instances of apply. If you're using apply with numeric data, probably could be doing it faster. Awesome. So chaining, working with raw data, Jupyter uh, effective use, avoiding apply. You got a couple more for us, Matt? Sure. Uh, um, maybe I've got two more. Uh, one nice. is uh, using the correct types. So mm. this is another thing that is, is pretty important. And it, and you see that in, in the tweak as well, where when we're loading our data, oftentimes people will load their data from a CSV file. And CSV files are nice in that they're human readable, but that's about the extent of the niceness of a CSV <laughs> file. Um, the other nice thing is that they're all over the place, which may or may not be nice. But oftentimes you'll get these CSV files and they might be encoded in some weird Windows encoding or they might have uh, characters that Pandas doesn't understand. So Pandas will try and convert nu numeric columns to num numbers, but if it has a string or some value that it doesn't understand, then it's going to leave it as a string. So you, you have those sorts of issues. Um, so you, you do want to make sure that you look at your types and, and just make sure that things that you thought were numeric are numeric. But another one is, and this goes back to our strings, and the pandas really doesn't optimize strings. But if you have categoric data where you have low cardinality, um, by default, if you read a CSV file in, pandas is going to represent that as a bunch, you know, if you've got like car makes and you've got like 20 car makes and you've got 50,000 rows, it's going to be 50,000 Python strings. Well, that's probably not optimal. And Pandas does have a way to represent that with what's called a categorical type. And so if you use a categorical type for that column, you're going to have a huge memory savings because if there are only 20 unique values, what it can do is it can make basically like a mask that's going to give a bunch of integers that are going to reference the list of 20. So it's basically going to be a number from 1 to 20. And then if you, if you wanted or if you needed to do like string operations on the make, now, instead of doing string operations on 50,000 Python objects, you're only doing that on 20. So not only do you get a memory in a memory savings from doing that, you can also potentially get a huge speed improvement from doing that. There is a point of crossover where when the cardinality gets to a certain point because of that layer of indirection, where it makes sense to leave it as Python strings rather than categoricals. Nice. Great tip. All right. And then sixth and final one. Yeah, the, the next one would just be uh, learn to to master aggregation. So this would be pivoting or group by. Right. This Definitely. is a syntax that can be a little bit different if you're not used to it, because generally it's it's done in at least two or three steps where we specify what we want to group by, and then we might pull out what we want to group, and then we do aggregations to them instead of just one step. Or alternatively, there is a pivot table syntax. And uh, um, my advice would just be 
start playing around with that and get used to that. It, it might seem a little bit overwhelming or confusing at first, but if you can master that, it's going to make slicing and dicing your, your data easier. If you need to start you know, making reports, you can do that. Or if you need to uh, uh, aggregate things at a certain level to prep them for machine learning, it's going to make it really easy to do that.